Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Cruz. Welcome back to The Culture Code. Today, our guest is the Chief People Officer at Aperion, Addie Johnson. Addie, welcome and tell everyone where you're joining from today. Hi, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. I am joining you today just north of Boston on the East Coast. Just north of Boston. And I mentioned I'm also East Coast, a little south of you in Philadelphia. We're going to dive in deep into culture topics. Um, but let me start by already throwing your curveball. Just um, share with everyone, are you guys fully remote? Are you hybrid? Are you in office? Because that's obviously on a lot of chief people officers' minds. And I think it's so relevant to the kind of culture that Aperion has. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hybrid would describe us best. Hybrid sliding towards fully remote in some of our locations. We are about 65 full-time people located around the globe and mm -hmm. seven different countries, 10 different states in the U.S. So by nature of what we do, most of our work is remote anyway. So our time in the office is spent more to connect, to socialize, but most of us are 80% plus remote, if not fully remote with the organization. And for those who aren't familiar with Aperion, what do you guys do? Sure. Well, our mission is to bridge boundaries through deeper understanding of ourselves and others. And we do that through our platform, Aperion, which is a learning platform for growing cultural competence and inclusion within and beyond the workplace. So our platform offers assessments, live instructor-led training, self-paced learning, and additional tools for individuals to develop better awareness of ourselves and others so that teams can collaborate more inclusively. We've been around for over 30 years. And as I mentioned, we're a smaller global organization. Uh, so a lot of the challenges that our clients face in working across time zones, cultures, wanting to build more inclusive global spaces, we understand we, we live that and need to practice and walk the talk ourselves every day here at Aperion. So let's dive in more deeply. I mean, obviously, um, given the nature of what you do, I would predict, I would guess that that folks at Aperion have a strong sense of mission, probably very mission and purpose oriented. But what else? Like, how would you describe your culture to someone who's an outsider? Mm, mission driven, absolutely, as you just called out, is, is first of mind. Tied to that is being globally minded. So really thinking outside of ourselves and authentic. It's always been very important to us that our insides match our outsides. We are who we say we are. We're really connecting not just our intent and what we do and how we do it, but the impact of our actions as well. I'm, I'm taking um, lots of notes. I have a, an ear for language. I, I like it that you talked about that, you know, intent. It's not just about mm -hmm. the impact, you know, how you're showing up. And, Absolutely. you know, I, I always say on these interviews, culture, well, good culture doesn't happen by accident. Maybe bad culture happens because it's accidental, right? Nobody's thinking <laughs> about it. Nobody's trying to work on it. Um, but what are you doing to foster, you know, and sustain this culture? You've been around a long time now. And so, you know, I imagine there's, there's new joiners, you know, every year that sort of have to um, learn about the culture, the cultural behaviors and norms. And yet you also maybe have some long tenured employees who you want to make sure it stays fresh. So what are some of the ways you do that? Yeah, great question. And not too surprising, it comes back to our values and being really deeply rooted in our values tied with our mission, of course. Uh, we fortunately went through um, a really great period the past several months of taking another deeper look at our values. To your point, we do have a lot of folks here that have been here 10, 15 years, myself over 17 now. Um, so really taking a deep look at not only who we have been, who we are now, but also who we want to be. Mm -hmm. So it's given us a really important opportunity to ensure that our values are very clear, they're intentional, and they're not just something that looks good on a website or a job description, but is really deeply embedded into all of our processes, policies, recruitment. It really touches every portion of the employee life cycle. So that means as a new hire, you're really connected to our values. You know what they are and what they mean to you in your day-to-day -day work and how they actually show up and can help you solve problems. 
they're in our performance management systems. It's having us take a, the opportunity to think about values that maybe we're really exhibiting well, and what are some that we might want to lean into a little bit more and might offer a growth edge for us. Uh, but really thinking through our values and all that we do, that is our root, that is our foundation. And our values certainly speak to the culture, again, who we are today, but also who we want to be. When it comes to culture and engagement, the, the role of the manager is so you know critical as I mean, they're the filter of everything, the good news, the bad news, uh, their emotions transfer to those around them, whether they're engaged or disengaged. Now, you're a relatively small company. You don't have the luxury of, you know, a 20 person leadership development department, right? The same, same lead acts, you know, we're, we're in similar <laughs> lines of work. And um, uh, while we care about these things, we don't have the resources to invest in them internally ourselves. So what are some of the ways that you are developing or supporting your, your managers, especially your frontline managers? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. As a smaller organization, by nature, we don't have entire departments set up to provide that formal training necessarily. However, we've been able to prioritize setting our managers up for success when they first enter that management career path. All of our managers right now at Aparian started off as individual contributors. So as they start down that management path, they already have a sense of, of relationship and credibility with their teams and they actually understand what their teams are doing because mm -hmm. they've been in that role themselves so starting them off on the right foot is really helpful access to our tools and training is really important so as a, a provider of, of products and services to our clients we're helping our clients understand how to provide feedback across cultures for example how to build psychological safety within a global team. So we're ensuring that our managers, our internal teams have access to that same training um, and content so that again, we're walking the talk. Because of our size, we do also have the advantage where we can offer one-on-one -on -one coaching with myself and other experts in the organization. We have very few intact teams. Most of our teams are remote, they're globally dispersed. Um, so having a mentor in another cultural location that can provide really important insight to our managers about managing across cultures and working with different work styles has been really, really helpful. So most of that learning, while it's not in a formal process per se, it's on the job in real moments and real challenges that come up uh, that they're able to learn and grow. Yeah, there's a couple of things that you mentioned there that I think... Um you know, people, folks in all sizes of organizations can take away, including, you know, you talked about that so many of the managers uh, have been promoted from within. They kind of know the roles and the jobs. And I, it reminds me of uh, General Ron Bailey, um, former retired general in the U.S. Marine Corps, told me once, for him, leadership was about uh, character and competence. You know, he says you can have strong character integrity, but if the, the Marines under your command don't think you're competent. They're not going to want to follow you, especially, you know, mm -hmm. in battle. And, and I think that there probably was a younger version of myself that thought, you know, leaders need to know how to do the people stuff right. You don't have to be a software engineer to manage software engineers, et cetera. But it sure helps, doesn't it? Like, it to, does to help. It does help. help all the people and to know that you've got that credibility of like, okay, you have walked in their shoes or similar shoes in the past is, is really critical. And the fact that you can, you personally can give coaching and, and guidance and people can have internal mentors, that doesn't have to take a lot of time or money. I think people think of leadership development and they assume they're spending $5,000 a head to send someone to a boot camp or $2,000 a head for an SL2 workshop or whatever it is. Some of the best developmental things will be coaching and or mentorship mm -hmm. opportunities. It takes time, but uh, nothing's completely free. But if an organization is smaller and doesn't have the financial resources, they certainly can use their experts, people who are doing it well, to guide mm -hmm. the others. And I think we can all be you know, sort of reminded of that um, approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about um, w with all the different ways that you do foster you know, culture there, is there any one... I don't know, initiative or approach that you're especially proud of or that you want to put a spotlight on? 
Yes. Um, there's probably two that, that have come up in the past year in particular. Uh, one is, is based around our values and ensuring, again, that they're not just something that looks good on a website, that folks really understand what they mean and how they can be used as a tool to solve challenges that come up in the workplace. So we had our departments go through team by team and do an indexing exercise for each of our values. So take a look at the value, for example, stay curious and keep learning. What does that value look like when maybe we're not living it enough? Maybe we're not asking questions. We're not taking the initiative to stay on top of trends in our industry. But also, what does it look like in excess when we're so curious that maybe we're starting to shift into shiny object syndrome and we're not focusing on what we also need to get done in our work? So really having every person in the organization understand what those values look like over and under and when they're done just right in our roles. So we were able to roll that out across our organization this year and are embedding that moving forward in our performance management system as well. So we're really proud of that. And the second initiative tied to culture, two of our values are trusting each other and taking ownership. So as a management team, we wanted to try something called Refresh Fridays, where we have all of our local offices end 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. So allow folks to start their weekends a bit early, come back more refreshed on Monday, that was a scary thing to do. We're shortening the work week. How will that impact our productivity? How will that impact teams working across time zones? But we really had to focus on those values. Do we trust each other to get work done? And will folks be accountable for their work? And we believe that folks will. So that was an opportunity for us to really put those values uh, into practice this year through that new initiative. How, how long have you had Refresh Fridays rolling now? We started them earlier in the summer. So it was an interesting experiment to see how it works in the summer when folks already have some vacation planned in certain parts of the world. But we also recognized that was the busiest period and quarter for our product development team and our marketing team. So they weren't necessarily able to take advantage of it so much. Yeah. So now that we're going into the last quarter where they can take their breath a little bit, it's more challenging for our sales team and closing out into the year initiatives as well. So. We're going through an iterative process you know, with this policy, collecting feedback as we go, making sure that our intent to reward employees and allow them to feel refreshed is actually matching the impact. But we've had wonderful feedback so far. So again, we're constantly iterating, fine tuning uh, to be able to keep this policy in place. Oh, that's great. And Addie, I want to go back and underline something you said um, that we're not done with the interview yet, but I think this is going to be the gold from the interview. You talked about... <laughs> Uh, every team sort of, you know, doing this review and indexing across the values and that it's not just um, what to do if you're under index, but you can over index. And this is uh, for our listeners. I want to unpack that a little bit because, and I noticed, you know, it's great that you take an assessment driven approach. Um, I saw on, on your website, it looks like your assessment, or at least a big part of it is based on the five factor model of personality, which is the gold standard, of course, um, you know, for behavior and personality. And when you get into personality work, you realize that almost every strength can also be a, a weakness or a derailer if you're not aware of the potential downside. And, you know, similar to what you mentioned, someone who has high growth mindset, high open openness to experience, that's usually a good thing. You're going to be a learner, you're going to be an innovator. But if I'm constantly thinking in the clouds and researching to the point where I'm missing deadlines, or I can't make a decision, you know, I, we can over index on that as well. And I think most people just automatically think when it comes to their strengths, when it comes to certain personality traits, higher is better, you know, I want five out of five. Okay, that's good, as long as you're not overdoing it, over rotating on your, on your swing. And I think that's really mm -hmm. helpful for people to understand. Yeah. And I want to add on that a little bit in terms of our particular approach to work style preferences, for sure, there are personality differences that come in and can impact um, how we make decisions, how we see the world, what biases we may come in with. Uh, but our approach in looking at differences or um, different aspects, um, of diversity as well as worse all preferences. There's not one that's better or worse than the other. 
it's more understanding that we have different approaches. What are those differences mm -hmm. and what are some concrete strategies to bridge those differences, to bridge those different work styles? So you might have folks that are really engaged by taking risks and that gets yeah. them excited. And then you have folks that are more comfortable with certainty and risk can make them more uncomfortable. There isn't one that's good or bad. For sure, anything in excess can cause trouble. But being able to understand the value that each of these work styles can bring to the workplace, really respecting that, embracing that, that's what's going to build a workplace with more inclusion and belonging. Love it. Love it. Um, you know, this is a short format podcast, so this is where I have to uh, <laughs> move on to faster, maybe a little bit more fun questions. Starting with, um, you know, imagine you could send a, a book or a podcast or anything media wise, you know, to to all of your colleagues and they they would promise to consume it and internalize it, and live it. What are you going to send everyone? Well, we do send one <laughs> to everyone that we, we really want them to live, embrace um, and dig deep into. Um, and that is inclusive leadership. It is written by our, our founder, Dr. Ernest Gunling, and co-written by our colleague, Dr. Shara Williams. Um, it's really, really overwhelming to where you're at in your own journey to become more inclusive. How can I, as an individual, contribute to a workplace and even beyond the workplace, to my family, to my community, to inspire others to be more inclusive. Um, and the book's approach is looking at it, starting with the individual, what are specific behaviors that you can change mm -hmm. that will have a larger impact. So it makes it practical, <laughs> more doable, again, at the individual stage and seeing what large impact can start just from you, the individual. But coupled with that, I think a good partner book to that, um, of course, is Adam Grant, um, think again, it's all about being flexible and thinking and taking what you think is the truth and your preset notion of something and going, is that true? Is that right? And that is really in a critical approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. What is my perception? What biases are coming in? What can I relearn? Uh, and what can I think about differently? Yeah, I, I love that. Great recommendation. Um, I'm curious. So, uh, Addy, how long have you been a chief people officer or head of people in your career now? Uh, I have been in a version of this role probably about six, seven years, a, a department of one um, yeah. uh, as a member of our leadership team, about seven years now. So let me ask you, like, imagine you could send a message to a younger version of yourself, a note to yourself on day one when you, you know, first took on the role. What advice would you give? It's so important to have good partners and good vendors um, mm -hmm. that obviously provide great products that make your life easier, you're more productive, but to seek partners and vendors that have shared values. Um, it can be lonely in a CPO position in any HR position, um, and you can develop really wonderful partnerships and mentorships with vendors, getting creative through your network, uh, but really thinking not only about the product that they're offering, but the values that they have as well. So I have wonderful partners in place now that I'm so grateful for um, and really focusing on their values as well um, has been something I've learned recently uh, the, the importance of. Well, I'm certainly glad. Um, again, we're, we are both, our companies are vendors to others, right? And so maybe we get it more than... Uh, uh, a, a lot of people out there, but it, it's so true because, I mean, none of us want to be um, sold to all the time or be put into a transactional relationship, but the best vendors are doing interesting work and talking to a lot of other people in a similar situation. So they should be, the best ones can be a great resource for innovative ideas, what's working, problem solving, et cetera. And um, I always say, uh, you know, I make friends for life and, you know, it's like we, you never know, you know, like who's going to be working for whom, who's going to be asking a favor of whom, who's just going to you know, run into each other and want a great cup of coffee or beer or something at a trade show. Like it's just life, you know, and so to have these partnerships can be um, so critical. And I'm curious, we're in November of 23 that we're doing this interview. As you're thinking about the year ahead, 2024 is upon us. 
Um, in your CPO role, like what's, what's your priority or focus going to be, you know, for the year ahead? Mm. I'd say my priorities are aligned also with our development, our roadmap too, for, for our platform and product. Um, you know, as we look ahead to 2024, there is more conflict. There are more barriers, more boundaries everywhere in the world right now. And yeah. our mission is to break those down and to give folks the tools to, to bridge. So it feels very hopeful to be in a position that can help and, I internally am looking forward to using our platform more to give more ownership to individuals on their learning journey, meet them where they're at, provide more formal education through our platform for managers or people managers. And we'll be able to do that externally too, because it is hard as a department of one or <laughs> department of 50 even um, to know where to start and how to really help your employees along their learning journey especially around inclusion. Um, so I'm excited to focus more on that internally, use more of our own products internally and be able to reach a wider audience externally as well. Yeah, so it sounds like you're excited. The internal and external is, is the same. Some new, uh, new functionality, right. get even more usage. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Addy, I appreciate this, um, this time. Time's our most valuable asset, so I don't take it lightly. You've given me some time to share uh, experience and wisdom and showing, you know, that you can foster great culture, do amazing initiatives without that 20 person support team uh, in place. So thanks again, Chief People Officer Perian, Addie Johnson. Thank you. Thank you.